this is uh, Derek Cholet here. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, I'm really delighted uh, you could join us this morning, and uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be joined by uh, three colleagues uh, from across GMF. Uh, Christina Kausch, uh, who's a resident fellow, GMF, uh, based in our Brussels office, but coming to us today from Madrid, uh, Spain, uh, Gordana Delich, who is uh, the director of uh, the of the Balkan uh, Trust for Democracy, who's uh, runs our Belgrade office, but is joining us from uh, outside of Belgrade, uh, preparing for the quarantine uh, that's coming about this weekend, which she'll tell us more about. And Mikhail Baranovsky, uh, who is director of our Warsaw office and also a fellow uh, at GMF. And he is also joining us uh, from outside Warsaw, where uh, he can tell us about what's going on there. So the, the purpose of our meeting here this morning is I'd like uh, our three colleagues to uh, offer some brief opening thoughts about the, the, the crisis as they're seeing it from where they're sitting. Uh, so principally from Spain, uh, Serbia, and Poland both in terms of the current conditions, uh, what's going on at the moment. Uh, I've also asked them to talk about the discussion that's underway about how to start to climb out of this crisis and, and what the, what the off-ramp uh, looks like uh, at this moment. And then also to touch a little bit about the, the, the larger policy issues uh, that are being surfaced as a result of this crisis. Um, so we've got a short, bit of time here this morning, so I've asked each of our uh, my colleagues to offer about five minutes of opening remarks, and then we're going to open it up to questions uh, from those of you joining. And to ask a question, use the, the Q&A function on uh, the Zoom system. So just hit the Q&A, type up a question, and I will uh, get to it when we get to the Q&A uh, period. So why don't we start uh, with Christina Kausch uh, in, in Madrid. Christina, over to you. Thank you, Derek, and good morning from Madrid, Spain. So Spain has been uh, in Europe, one of, after Italy, the most affected country from the COVID crisis. Uh, worldwide, it is uh, number two after the United States in infections, and number three after the United States and Italy in, uh, in fatalities. Um, it has 100 currently, as of today, the figures are, I believe, roughly 150,000 infected, officially registered, and 15,000 dead. So uh, also Spain stands out for quite high, for a very high death rate, which is around 10%, which many, however, uh, ascribe to, to, to statistics. Now, how has the government reacted? Um, I think um, you could say that the Spanish government uh, took its time. It, it, it reacted relatively late, but then all the more forceful. Um, Throughout January and February, the government received a number of alerts from the WHO um, in various forms. It was asked, for example, uh, to, uh, to stock up its sanitary materials and so on, to which the Minister of Health said, we have enough. Now we can clearly see that's not the case, uh, because it lacks everywhere of masks, of tests, I mean, everything. Um, 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 and um, as, as late as March 8th, uh, there was a public rally uh, um, allowed in Madrid of 120,000 people, um, including several ministers from the current cabinet, who later tested positive for coronavirus. Uh, and that was only three days before the schools were closed. So uh, from there on, it really uh, spread over the country. So I think that like in many places, uh, the government did not understand and grasp the magnitude of this uh, uh, on time. Um, but then they decided, uh, so you imagine this rally was on a Saturday. On Wednesday, the schools closed. And on Friday or Saturday, the, I can't remember exactly, they, they decided on a, on a very, very strict lockdown, which has been going on ever since. So we've been, uh, we've been, uh, we've stayed at home completely for a month now. Um, we're not allowed to go out except for buying groceries or medicine. Uh, no exercise. Children have been locked up in, in their in flats for a month and no end in sight. Yesterday, the Congress approved a further um, two weeks and we expect this to go on. Um, now, the current situation is that you can see that the lockdown really works. The curve has effectively been flattened today. I think the number is 
So the, at the peak last week, the number of daily the, the, of, of fatalities the day was as high as 900 something. And today the number is 605. So you can, we are at a sort of plateau, but tendency going low. So, so there's, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, it works, yeah. And, um, and it's, as I said, they're also enforcing the lockdown very strictly. The police is patrolling the streets. I mm, go out like every few days to go buy groceries. And so far I've been stopped by the police four times. So um, they're very strict on this. Now, uh, what, however, um, I think what the people here are really afraid of now is not even that much the virus. I think the real fear is the economic impact. Spain has been one of the countries uh, together with Greece, after Greece, uh, that has had suffered the most from the uh, from the economic crisis that followed the financial crisis in 2008. Um, as of 2013, there was still an un unemployment of 26 percent in Spain. Um, um, today, Spain still has uh, an, a huge uh, public debt of about 96 percent of, uh, of GDP. Um, last year, the data for unemployment was still at 14%, and that was pre-corona. And now, obviously, like everywhere, the, the jobs are going, uh, you know, the people losing jobs. And, you know, even if there are programs now to, to avoid people losing their jobs because of a confinement, we will see what the impact in the longer run is on the job market. So I think that is really where people are very, very uh, concerned. And that is also why uh, the focus of the Sanchez government has been uh, in these last two weeks to seek help from the European Union, because they said, of course, if the European Union is not helping and showing solidarity in a crisis of that such fundamental uh, uh, magnitude, what's what's the point of it? You know, so um, so so people have, and at the same time, I think the Spaniards really felt uh, in, um, back in the, in the financial crisis, really felt that the way the EU Troika was dictating austerity measures on the Spanish economy, uh, saving banks with taxpayer monies on the back of the, 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 the small workers uh, with, a, with a terrible eco uh, social impact, um, people remember that and they're still partially suffering from that. And they, you can really feel that People think, oh no, the North is doing it, they're doing it again, you know. So the fear was very big. So in that sense, yesterday that the Eurogroup came to a conclusion, even though it was short of the Euro bonds, the mutualization of debt uh, to the Union, um, it's it, it still the, the uh, EU finance, Mr. Eurogroup finance ministers yesterday, after long hours of, of, of debate, agreed on a 500 billion package um, uh, from the EU of help for the corona crisis to face, uh, to, to support the, the budgets of governments, but also SMEs and uh, programs for, uh, for the unemployment, so unemployed. So I think that was a victory for the Sanchez government, or at least that's, that's how the, 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 the media look at it here today. And uh, I think there's clearly hope that the Eurobonds topic is not off the table yet. That has been lifted to the heads of state and government level. And uh, yeah, and. Uh, so far, we we expect to be confined for many more weeks to come. Thank you, Christina. Uh, Gordana, over to you from Serbia. Gordana, you got on mute. Yes, I'm sorry, I forgot that. Um, hello, everyone, uh, and um, thank you for, for your time. Well, um, when it comes to Serbia, but also the whole of the Balkans, um, it, the, the crisis, as all crises, came in the most uh, inappropriate time because the government was uh, campaigning already since we had elections scheduled for April 20th. And Vucic, Alexander Vucic, the current incumbent president of Serbia, was doing really great in the polls uh, prior to the COVID crisis. So obviously, this crisis came uh, as something that um, ruined the plans uh, to prolong the, uh, the, the government, to, to prolong his seat in, um, in the government for another uh, four years. Uh, so what we saw was um, initially a complete denial of the existence of the crisis, even though it was happening in our uh, very close neighborhood, like Italy uh, and elsewhere. 
but then within a week, we moved from an absolute denial of the crisis into a martial law and a curfew enforcement, uh, where our civic rights uh, and basically, I'm not quite sure, but even the constitution uh, has been put in jeopardy. Basically, the martial law was proclaimed without the involvement of the parliament, which is not, uh, which is illegal. But this is not something that can be done. However, it was then explained that it had to be done uh, because the government was aware of the fact that it will need to shift uh, people, meaning uh, doctors, from one hospital to the other, from one city to the other. And this, uh, unless there is a martial law, uh, requires a lot of paperwork. So this is one of the explanations. In terms of the numbers, how we are dealing here with the people who are sick and people who have unfortunately died, we're not doing that terribly uh, badly. Uh, I have to give it to the government. Uh, one thing is different for Serbia than is maybe for some other countries in our neighborhood. We had within um, two weeks uh, an influx of people uh, Serbian citizens who came back of around 500,000 people came back between March 1st and March uh, 14th, uh, came back home. Uh, and this, um, uh, a, a huge number of these people uh, were already positive on COVID-19. And that has increased the number of, uh, uh, of patients basically in the hospitals. But However, we have a really good team uh, of doctors who are um, organizing everything that needs to be organized in terms of, 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 of you know, medical uh, health care uh, for, for the patients. Um, but what we are also seeing, we are seeing all of the problems that were maybe put under the carpet surfacing. And this is basically what this crisis is doing throughout the entire region, but also globally. So, for example, the government never stopped campaigning. What we see now is that the government calls people on, please don't panic, but then the government is the one who is producing panic because this panic is necessary for the campaign that is taking place at the same time as we are fighting this, this, this horrible virus. Um, we have, for example, um, changed the way we, we charge people. So uh, the curfew was installed right after the martial law was proclaimed, a few days after. So from 5 p.m. in the uh, afternoon until 5 in the morning on work days, we cannot go out. And for the weekend, and this is why my background is so ugly, for example, we, we, we have a lockdown from Friday afternoon until Monday morning, which is why me and my family, we escaped to our cottage nearby uh, Belgrade, um, because we have three children and I just couldn't figure out how to to hold uh, for four days uh, between the four walls. But um, back to, to, to Serbia, uh, we have some real uh, cases of, of human rights violations. So we have three people who have been prosecuted already, but via Skype and sentenced, and one of them has been sentenced to three years of imprisonment. And why? Because um, this person uh, returned from, I don't know which country, uh, was uh, positive on COVID-19 and was told to self-quarantine for uh, two weeks. That person, well, okay, that person really didn't behave uh, uh, responsibly, uh, but nevertheless, uh, we do not want to see this kind of practice taking place. So, and this is what is being, uh, what is being debated right now within the civil society. Um, we are also worried about the lack of parliament because the parliament has been dissolved immediately when the martial law was, was proclaimed. So what, what we are seeing is an ever stiffer hand uh, in terms of governing the country that is happening. Um, and we wonder where it is going to take us. Many of the foreigners ask me what I think about uh, this uh, uh, Chinese um, um, relationship that, that Serbia uh, all of a sudden is uh, even more, um, how should I say, um, um, uh, cultivating. Uh, but um, I wouldn't give it as much uh, maybe um, value as, as, as some people in Western Europe are giving. China is interested in Serbia far less than it is interested in Italy. But uh, 
what is interesting about Serbia is that it's a vulnerable country, it's a fragile country, it's easy to manipulate, and China is interested in, in Serbia only if Serbia is a valid partner or possibly a member of the EU. Um, otherwise, um, Serbia is not big enough. It is not, uh, it is not a country that China would be crucially interested in. However, we shall see where it takes us. We are also seeing a lot of uh, um, um, an exaggerated thank you to countries like Russia, Turkey and China in comparison to uh, EU. However, what is good is that in the last couple of days, um, basically the business people, small, medium enterprises, but also larger ones, and this is what, what is the same as my predecessor said, what, what people are truly worried about is the economic crisis and how many lives will, will that take afterwards. Um, and nobody can fool people uh, with, with regards to that. We all know it's going to be really, really bad. So the business people are the ones who have raise the voice about the necessity of uh, keeping really good relationship with the EU. And why is this? It is because two thirds of our trade and export especially is with the EU. It is almost neglect, it is almost to, to you know, w with regards to China, we don't even have to mention it. There is no export from Serbia to China. There is only import from China to Serbia. So if we take into consideration following three aspects is that our trade is two thirds with the EU. Our remittances, which are a significant part of our economy, do come from Serbian citizens who live mostly in Western countries, mostly in the EU and then also in the US. And then also there is a third aspect of the economic crisis which we need to take into account and that is the relationship we have with our key economic partners. So. The government has announced that, um, where was this number, uh, it will, uh, that the, the package for the economic um, uh, healing will be 5.1 billion euros. Of this 5.1, if I understood correctly, uh, 3.1 is supposed to come from the state. I'm not quite sure how this will happen, but 2 billion is supposed to come from our key economic partners, but usually what we talk about the key economic partners in this segment is our banks, investment banks, like European Investment Bank or the EBRD. Now, if our relationship with EU keeps deteriorating, um, I think everyone knows where it might lead us. And this is what the business people um, in, in Serbia are truly worried about. And I think um, that if something pulls us back on track, it will be precisely the people from the business sector and also the people in the in the civil society. When it comes to civil society, I have to say that it took a really, really uh, good approach to fighting um, uh, all of the crises that the, the COVID-19 has basically uh, pushed to the surface uh, from human rights and to thinking of the economic healing afterwards. And I should stop now because I've taken too much time. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Gordana. Uh, Mikhail, over to you from Warsaw. And it, but before you go, uh, let me just remind everyone that uh, we'll be taking questions uh, uh, after uh, Michael's opening comments and then uh, use the Q&A function. We already got some questions in the queue, but use, some, use the Q&A function to ask your question. Thanks. Uh, Michael, over Thanks, to you. Derek. Thanks, Derek, and it's great to see my colleagues. It's nice to see you all on the other side of the of the camera. Uh, even though the subject that we are addressing is is a pretty uh, sobering one, um, I wanted to really address three aspects of the COVID nineteen crisis in Poland. One is the health issues and the health dimension. The other one is foreign policy, and thirdly, maybe most importantly, is domestic and political impact. Uh, I'll start with the first one. I mean, Poland is doing actually very well comparing to many other European countries when it comes to the impact of the crisis. As of this morning, we had still under 6,000 people that have been confirmed with uh, coronavirus, 5,750. That's small number by comparison to Spain, Italy, and, and many others. We still have under 200 uh, deaths. So that's, again, uh, small. 
Um, these numbers, uh, this relatively good outcome, health outcome, is uh, credited to good extent to the fact that the social distancing measures have been introduced uh, very, very early on, and, uh, and, and, and people stuck to it. Uh, they have been two days ago extended, so we are not, as a country, uh, leaving the state of, uh, of a lockdown, but, uh, but they are, the impact is not, not as severe. It's, the measures are similar as in many other countries. The schools are, are closed, uh, most of the stores are closed, but there is no problem with moving between cities. Uh, you should not um, necessarily take a stroll around Warsaw and you could, be, you could be fine for that, but so far the enforcement has not been as rigid as we have seen uh, in, uh, in other uh, countries. With a little caveat here, I will say on the, on the, on the number of cases, some people don't fully trust the numbers. Uh, there is, for example, a question of whether all uh, COVID cases, uh, deaths have been um, accounted for, um, but that's because of the way they are coded. Um, but largely, this is still, you know, we are nowhere near as uh, some, of the, some of the other uh, countries in Europe. So what about foreign policy? Uh, I was just thinking about it ahead of our, uh, of our meeting, and I would say that foreign policy does not exist. We are as if we uh, as if we were a little island in the middle of uh, the uh, of a of an ocean. It's it's all the debates are about what's going on domestically. Um, yes, we are looking to other countries, but it's much more about uh, comparison and whether Poland is doing better or worse. The only little aspect of debate is about the role of the EU and whether EU is doing enough or not enough. Um, whether Poland should show a greater solidarity also of other countries to, uh, to other countries, but that's a relatively uh, small debate when we look at either the health impact, the economic impact that is also very severe and, and has been uh, addressed by now two stimulus measures um, and, and the, the debate over uh, corona bonds or euro bonds that Christina mentioned is, is also not present in Poland because Poland is not part of the eurozone. The biggest impact by far, um, of, of course, on an average citizen, the health impact is what people really are feeling. But the, the, the impact that is changing the country the most is, this, is the domestic political impact. Um, this is happening because, like in Serbia, uh, Poland was supposed to hold presidential election on May 10th uh, this, this year. The crisis hit. And, uh, and, and, and it, instead of bringing us together, it further polarized uh, Polish society and Polish political class, maybe especially, because this society uh, has been relatively uh, um, clear on what they would prefer. Um, uh, the preference, the wide uh, population-wide preference is to postpone the vote uh, to a time where we can all go to polling stations where people can campaign, but the government right now is very strongly pushing for uh, election to take place by mail. Uh, this is, uh, this is a, a very tall uh, order in, when it comes to logistics, because we are talking about May 10th. At the latest, they can be postponed to May 23rd. Um, but maybe more importantly, as it was recently pointed out by the Office of Democratic Institutions and Human Rights at OSCE, the elections will take place, if they do happen, they take place at a time of deep crisis when no one else, with the exception of uh, incumbent president who has ability to, 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 to function as a president, no, no, uh, no other candidates are able to, to campaign. So this is really tear tearing us apart. Uh, it's, uh, it's polarizing Poland even further, and we are already a, a polarized country. It uh, clearly seems to give uh, undue advantage to, to the current government and the current uh, president. And therefore, um, therefore it, was, uh, it will create, if the elections go forward, I clearly see that it will create a, a crisis of legitimacy uh, for the next uh, president because the opposition will say these were not fair um, elections. So this is the space to 
to watch. Uh, it's still not a done done deal. There is a possibility of of reversal in in couple weeks, and it created already even a crisis in the in the ruling coalition. The one the deputy prime minister resigned for for the reasons of in preparing postponing the elections and the leader of uh, of the ruling party pushing back on this. But this is the space to watch uh, how the crisis in, is impacting really the fabric of uh, of our uh, political system and, and in the in the end really the fabric of our democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, and thanks to Christina and Gordana for those opening comments. It's you know interesting th listening to this from Washington. Many of the same uh, themes uh, are being discussed here in terms of you know everything from the the nitty-gritty of our daily lives and how we how long social distance, distancing will go on to uh, questions of government surveillance and and what that means for uh, civil liberties and uh, but then also the uh, future of, of elections and and um, uh, the threat to democracy that that this pandemic and its response poses uh, so Again, use the Q&A function to ask questions. We already have a bunch of questions in the queue, but please do uh, ask your question. We'll try to get to all of them. I would like to just, just ask one broader question to all of you just to get a quick response. Um, Gordana mentioned China and, and uh, the, the perspective from Serbia of, of the way China is, um, is playing. And there's one follow-up question I'll just get to right now, I guess, Gordana, for you from from Noah Barkin on this, which is uh, why your take on why Vucic is is bashing the EU and sort of playing up the relationship with China. But add to that, and this is for all of you, quickly, quick response on on how, if at all, Russia and its response is being viewed from where you sit and the way that uh, it's been trying to exploit this crisis to either undermine NATO solidarity or uh, show that it's a it's a more humanitarian actor than perhaps the United States, and then also just to what extent is the U.S. response to the crisis, to its own the, the crisis we're facing here, getting any coverage or attention from where you sit, and and how is that affecting the uh, or shaping the image of the United States uh, from your perspective? So why don't we quickly go around, starting with Christina, Gordana, and then Michael, and then we'll open it up to all of your questions. Thank you. Okay, so um, on the way the U.S. response is being um, evaluated here in Spain, the answer is not much. There is barely any coverage. I think obviously, you know, um, if, if I look at the, let's say, five major newspapers in Spain, the headlines uh, yesterday, there was only one that mentioned the United States, and that was somebody about something a White House representative had said about Spain's response. So it's really a bubble, which is about how we can fight uh, this crisis. But, and, and obviously there are, anytime there is some sort of baseline data and so the policy measures the Trump government is taking, uh, the development of the number of the figures, yeah, that is being transmitted, but I haven't seen a lot of qualitative evaluation at all. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Anything on Russia, Christina? Um, yeah, that's not so relevant. I mean, you know, um, here, mm, well, so this is pretty thin ice. There is uh, right now a lot of debate in Spain, but Spain is a polarized environment, politically speaking, you know, the, the, the political party structure has been sort of diversified after decades of, recently after decades of two party uh, uh, rule fighting in practice of alternation of power. So now, the, the extreme right party Vox that has emerged in the last uh, few years um, is now uh, engaged well, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a campaign of disinformation. They are very active on Twitter. Um, so, and that is being a lot criticized. Some say or presume that Russia has a hand in that, whether that's true or not, I'm not able to judge. Thanks, Cordana. Yes, thank you. So on why is Vucic bashing Europe and what is he expecting to gain from China? Um, not quite really sure, but uh, th there are several aspects of this. Um, the, the 
greatest bashing happened on the day or the evening when the martial law was installed. Um, and we have to know something about that day. That is the day when um, basically the entire Southern Europe, whether East or West, was looking at Italy and how it struggled. Uh, and through, you know, on all TV stations, uh, what was being said is that no help was coming from the EU. Um, the only EU answer that we got to that was, oh, we are so surprised. Um, and uh, I believe that the reaction that was happening in Italy those times was also one of the triggers, right, among the population. Um, we had, uh, Serbia only had less than 300 respirators, if even that, or ventilators, whatever they're called. Um, and um, many of them weren't really functioning. So he knew that if he was going to beat the, the crisis, um, and have, uh, you know, less people dead than there would be, uh, that Serbia really needed to get those respirators. So what was happening these days when, when, when the rhetoric was so strong was also the reports that were coming that, I don't know, there was an uh, airplane that was coming from China to help uh, Italy and, was, and, was, um, uh, and that plane was on, on Prague airport and was stopped and wasn't allowed to go to Italy. Then there was um, an airplane that was um, going to help uh, Slovenia, right, uh, in, in Hamburg, uh, at Hamburg airport, and it wasn't allowed to take off with all those masks that were in that um, airplane and so on. So it really gave gave a huge messy uh, picture of Europe where everybody is, you know, just trying to save their lives and who, you know, gives a damn about, about others. But the problem with this is that, um, you know, that, that people, people had a feeling that only autocratic regimes were the ones who were capable of basically responding to the crisis immediately, or you had to live in a rich country such as Germany, where you know that there are, I don't know how many, the tens of thousands of, of, of ventilators, right, in order to respond to it through a democratic, in, in a democratic way. But the thing, you know, for, for me that I have been asking myself is that if, why is nobody also mentioning how the crisis was fought uh, in 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 Wuhan? You know, uh, how many people unnecessarily died there, and not because of COVID nineteen, but because they were locked down. I mean, the people in Wuhan, the the, the government in Wuhan was was uh, literally. Uh, what's it called? Uh, um, not just not allowing people to get out of the of of the of the building, but also they made it impossible for the doors to open, right? So if you ask me, the, this epidemic became pandemic for one simple reason, and it's, it's, it's the same reason that is the reason for, for why Yugoslavia felt apart, and it's because of the lack of democracy. Because if the doctor in Wuhan was allowed to speak about that. And if the local government uh, in Wuhan felt, uh, you know, uh, uh, that, that it could react instead of uh, waiting for weeks until they got a yes, then we would not have a pandemic. We would probably have an epidemic that we would all need to, you know, deal with, but, or, or the China would need to deal with. But for me, what, what, what comes with this crisis is that, uh, uh, absolutistic leaders are notoriously known for employing people who are loyal, right? But then also they waste these loyal people over time. So what we see in Serbia is as well that um, paradoxically the most loyal people to Vucic are also the least professional people. So what you have is that um, a director of a certain hospital somewhere outside uh, Belgrade um, uh, thought that he was supposed to keep all the masks and, and, and everything, the, all the equipment that we got for what? In a storage so that when journalists come, then he can say, oh, look, we have everything that we need and wasn't giving it to, to those who needed it, like doctors, like nurses. You know, this is the real price that, that is happening. And I think also that Vucic is coming to an agreement with himself to, to, to realize that his best loyalties are going to cost him also a lot and, and going to cause a lot of damage for his public image as well. So, 
So why is he bashing Europe so much? I think also because it is because of Europe that we see everything uh, that, that where he is incompetent, right? But then again, I really think he cannot afford to, uh, to lose uh, Europe, right? I don't think he, I think he's perfectly aware of the fact that if there is an economic healing that will have to take place, it cannot happen without Europe. Thank you. Michael, over to you. Sure. So on Russia and the US, I mean, let me focus on this. Ru Russia is not particularly present in this in the debate. It, it, we don't see any particular signs of, uh, of interference besides the general um, propaganda that, that is seeping through throughout, throughout Europe. Um, so that's one thing. There are people who on the security and defense side are beginning to worry about what's going on in Russia because they are being hit so strongly by both the corona crisis and by the, uh, by the low oil prices uh, impacting their budget that people are, are beginning to worry, okay, what, what will effect on uh, Europe's security will have this domestic uh, potential even collapse of, uh, of Russia. Uh, and these are, of course, people who are worried about Russia uh, lashing out internationally. But this, this scenario hasn't played out, but it's certainly in the, in the back of our minds when we think about potential negative consequences. When it comes to the U.S., and, and you know, just to remind everyone, Poland is certainly one of the most pro-American uh, countries and, 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 and likes uh, Trump much more than many other European countries. Um, there is a very serious criticism of how U.S. has played it out, both domestically and internationally. We don't see uh, U.S. leadership internationally. We don't see... U.S. leadership uh, transatlantically. Uh, some of us who watch it carefully also are worried about lack of U.S. leadership within NATO, um, and uh, and that's you know that's for a country that is tied at a hip uh, uh, on security to to U.S. That's uh, that's that's very worrying. Um, one of the examples of it was uh, cancellation of the Defender 2020 um, exercise. Uh, but maybe more broadly, U.S. just does not look and behave like a, a world power and a, and a world leader that we as an ally need to uh, depend on. Um, so that's, that's, that, that's, of course, not, not something that's played out yet in policy terms, but uh, this is the, the conversation that, that many of us are having also on the conservative side. Uh, because of how bad uh, uh, bad situation looks like right now in the US. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael, for that. Um, actually, building on, on, Michael, your last comment about uh, the lack of US leadership at this point, I'd like to ask a bunch of, several questions we've received from our participants uh, into, into one kind of bigger question about the EU. Um, and and think w one question was asked about U.S. potential for U.S. EU cooperation, particularly as we're looking to climb out of this crisis uh, economically. Um, is, is there anything that you see as potential there? But then sticking with the EU, also just many several participants have asked for your perspectives on how you think this crisis as it's played out thus far, and understanding we're not we don't know how this ends yet exactly. Uh, but how does it impact the perception of the EU uh, uh, as an institution? How will it affect European solidarity? Um, and then more specifically, and Christina mentioned this a bit, you could maybe elaborate on it, and Gordana and Michael, you can, you can talk about it from, uh, to the extent it's relevant to you, is just how this financial package that was agreed to yesterday is, is being perceived, um, at least as a is whether it's in terms of actually helping the problem or uh, ability of the EU to respond to this crisis in any way. In other words, is the EU going to come out of this better or is this going to be the beginning? Is this the beginning of the end? Uh, why don't we go in reverse order? We'll start with Michael and then Gordana and then Christina. Mm -hmm. 
So when it comes to transatlantic cooperation, I think we there is a there is an opportunity in taking advantage of the fact that to some extent uh, the crisis is, pl is playing out at different speeds in different parts of our community. So so if we think about it in pooling and sharing terms, when we pull and share. Uh, the tests, the beds, the medical resources, the beds, the hospital beds, especially in Europe, then countries could help each other as they are going through the peak of the of the of the crisis. That could be the positive uh, way of um, of dealing with it. Unfortunately, right now, I think what we see is uh, transatlantically that that it's more of a feeling of a competition, right? I mean, there is a there's not a great level of coordination and some of the little things, but important things we have seen, the, the case of potentially buying up the German company producing, um, uh, working on a vaccine, points more to, to everyone for their own um, approach. And that's just not, not, uh, not, not good. Um, there is also a role for NATO. Um, uh, Derek and I are working on a paper on this. Where, where NATO can play an important role in smoothing out the logistics, and it, it is a very important role for a uh, strongest military transatlantic alliance. And, and I think it's a test. Uh, it's a test for all of us. It's a test for US leadership, it's a test for NATO, and it is a test for, 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 European, uh, for European Union. I mean, for the EU, it's, I think the one key dynamic uh, that I'm seeing in Poland is how, much the nation state has gained in this crisis. It really is playing out at a nation state level everywhere. Um, and uh, and if uh, national governments perform well without EU's help, then people will listen more to to them. I mean, the biggest the biggest case I think is still you know whether EU is able to. Um, uh, address some of the biggest problems um, in needy countries like uh, Italy and, 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 and Spain. Um, and that's going to be the real test for the EU beyond those two countries, I would say. Cordano. Yes, well, um, that's a really difficult question. I mean, in an already polarized society, uh, the polarization is uh, definitely um, deepening uh, basically uh, everybody here is looking you know what is going to happen with Europe uh, and literally two and a half or three weeks ago it looked as if it was all over uh, which I believe was something that gave Vucic even more um, uh, speed in, in what he was saying with regards to China but um, I I do believe that people uh, want to believe that Europe will somehow um, continue to exist even after this this crisis, possibly also because uh, uh, we are so dependent on Europe. However, everybody uh, is concerned that, that should uh, something uh, significant happen to Europe and should the national states that uh, Michael was mentioning really gain that much, then for us, uh, one of the key questions is um, in, in whose sphere of influence will we end up? Um, and, uh, you know, I would want us to remain in the sphere of influence of the transatlantic community. However, I think that is uh, a question uh, that uh, will be valid uh, in, I don't know how many months, but, uh, and it will be a question that will require an honest answer, really. The, the thing that uh, many uh, political analysts here are asking, will basically the countries in this, in, in this region have a real choice? Uh, or will they be simply uh, forced to uh, make agreements with China and with Russia, even those that they never planned to? So. Thanks, Cordana. Christina, over to you. And this, we are out of time, so this will be the last word, unfortunately. Christina, over to you. Um, ironically, the, 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 the financial crisis is now in hindsight, from, from today's perspective, looks a little bit like, 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 a, like, a, like a rehearsal for today's crisis, for, in terms of the EU's response, right? 
Um, and I think this is very much how this has been these last few weeks that have been dominated in the Spanish media by um, Pedro Sanchez attempts to, uh, together with the Italian uh, uh, government, to convince its Northern European partners of the win, particularly of Eurobonds, but also of this sort of uh, what they called um, uh, a new Marshall Plan. I don't know how, how, how accurate that anal analogy is, but basically meaning that um, we need to, un unlike 2000, uh, uh, 2008, 9, 10, we need to shoulder this together. You need to help us, you know. And um, well, it's only been yesterday that they've made this sort of, uh, that they adopted this package. Um, I think uh, the first reactions are very positive. It's also very important for Pedro Sanchez, who has been attacked pretty harshly by the conservative opposition here to fight for us in Brussels. So this is important. They found a formula that allows everybody to go home with it. Um, I do think that there is still um, uh, um, some reluctance. One, because the euro bonds, from at least from a Spanish perspective, the, the euro bonds issue or any other form of mutualization of, of debt is not off the table. And since they couldn't, and the finance ministers couldn't agree on it, they, they gave it to the, to, the, to the chancellor, president, heads of state and government uh, so, um, to, to deal with next week. So I think there's a little bit of a waiting position, but I do think that these agreements from yesterday are a very good start. The last two weeks were dominated by saying, so it's, as I said, it's doing it again. If they don't get their act together this time, then what the hell is the EU for? So I think, I think that's the first good step, but it's too early to judge. If they continue going that, and, and I do think that the debates, I'm following the German uh, media as well as the Spanish one, so you, you can kind of can look at this uh, north-south a gap from two perspectives, and I do think that the, the discussions also in Germany are very different, are going, going are much closer to the debates in Spain than they were back in, in, in 2008, 2009, 10. Well, thank you, Christina, for that. Uh, you've given us a lot, to, a lot to sort of think about as this crisis unfolds, um, so we're going to have to check back in. Uh, and, and so thanks to you, Christina. Thanks, Gordana. Thank you, Michael, for taking the time. Uh, thanks to all of you who joined us on Zoom. Um, one programming announcement uh, next week uh, in continuation of this series, uh, Perspectives from Europe, uh, we're going to be joined by uh, a leading Swedish uh, uh, health official um, who's going to be talking to us about how Sweden is responding to this crisis. Sweden has been a bit of an outlier in terms of how it's handling uh, social distancing. Um, and so I think that will be a very interesting discussion to figure out what they're doing differently and why and how that's working. Uh, so again, thank all of you uh, for joining us. Uh, we got to some of the questions, not all, perhaps some of our speakers can follow up directly with the participants uh, and some of the questions that did, we did not get a time to get answers for. Uh, but again, I thank you a lot. I want everyone to stay safe and stay healthy and have a great uh, holiday weekend for those of you celebrating the holiday. Thank you very much. Take care.